All right, so we are on Heaven Bible Study, part 53. We're actually going to finish the book of Daniel tonight. I have really enjoyed Daniel. It is a kind of a Old Testament revelation in a lot of ways of the things that we've been looking through, and we'll see that again tonight. But in our previous lesson, we did look at Daniel chapter 8 through 9. We saw that those that repent will receive God's mercy. We saw that God's kingdom will bring holiness to the earth. And then there will be a future persecution of God's people under the Antichrist. And if you remember, we talked about Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who really was a kind of a precursor of the Antichrist, and how we'll actually talk a little bit more about him tonight. But the revolt against him was where the holiday of Hanukkah came from. And also we saw last week that God wins. And you know, that's just the summary of Revelation. That's the summary of the Bible as a whole. You know, evil will not win. Satan will not win. God wins. And as such, his people win as well. So our heaven definition through this study is heaven is a spiritual realm where the greatest intensity of God's presence dwells eternally. It is a holy place because God is there. It is where God rules from His throne in the heavenly temple with the resurrected Jesus at His right hand. Holy angels and the souls of the redeemed, those that have been forgiven by grace through faith, live in heaven. Satan currently has access to the heavenly courtroom and accuses the saints daily. One day, Satan will be cast out of the heavenly courtroom forever. The souls of the redeemed saints will be reunited with resurrected and glorified bodies and will dwell on earth with Jesus for a thousand years. After the millennium, God will create a new universe in earth. Heaven will come down to earth and the redeemed will live forever with God in a glorified body on the new earth. So if you would, turn with me to page 5. We'll be looking at Daniel chapter 10 through 12 tonight. And as chapter 10 starts, it has been about two years since Cyrus gave the decree that the Jews could return to Jerusalem. Some did, but not all of them, including Daniel. He actually was stayed in the foreign land. And chapter 10, he has another vision. And in this vision... He understands, he understands the message and it grieves him greatly. What is it that's grieving him greatly? He's looking at the future. He's looking at possibly a war that was going on in heaven. And we'll get to talk a little bit more about that tonight. But in this vision too, he had a vision of a heavenly being. And this is from Daniel 10, 4 through 9. It says, Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Who is this that Daniel is seeing? Miss Barbara? Jesus. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? If you actually go to Revelation chapter 1, this is very much like the description that John sees of Jesus. So at the beginning, you have a, a man clothed in linen. So he is a, a priestly clothes. His waist is girded with gold of, of Uphaz. And in Revelation, we read that he has gold around his uh, waist or around his chest, I think, in Revelation. Also, his body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire. So you just see his power. And the eyes like fire are definitely from Revelation as well. His arms and feet like burnished bronze in color. In Revelation, it's described as brass. And the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And in Revelation, it says like the voice of many waters. This sounds a little bit like the description in Ezekiel as well. When Ezekiel has a vision of God in the first chapter of Ezekiel, he describes him with fire, with precious stones as well. 
And how does Daniel respond? Verse 7, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. I was thinking this kind of sounded similar to Paul's experience. You know, Paul was the one that had the vision of Jesus, and the other men did not see Jesus. But whatever the situation was, these men knew something was going on. It says a great terror fell upon them, and they fled. In verse 8, Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me. For my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words. And while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. This also sounds like description of John's response in Revelation as he falls down like a dead man when he has this vision of Jesus. But this might not be Jesus that it's describing here. So when we get into the 10th chapter of Daniel, this may be an angel that he's describing. The biggest key is if the vision he has is the same angel that is responding to him after that. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. I really think this is probably a vision of Jesus. And it's very appropriate as a vision of Jesus, as we'll see at the end, because this individual tells Daniel his future. He tells Daniel really not to worry, to live his life, and that he will rest one day. That is, his body will go to the ground but one day he will be resurrected and receive a great inheritance. So what a great opening this vision, but you can see Daniel was just overwhelmed with it. He fell down as a dead man. And we'll see a lot of what this vision is through 10, uh, 11, and 12. But what is heaven? What well, is God's dwelling place? And this is from Daniel 12, 4 through 7. And we're going to see the same man that he saw in verse 10 is mentioned in this chapter. It says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book into the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So all the things that Daniel has received in these visions, these things about the end times, the things about things to come, the person here tells him to seal the book to the time of the end. In other words, this vision is sure. It is stamped as a guarantee from God. And he says, seal it up because it's going to be available for those in the future. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. People want to know what's come. What is to come in this, this world? How do we know when things are wrapping up? Verse 5 says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and the other on that river bank. So these are probably angelic beings. Verse 6 and one said to the man clothed in linen. So that's the man clothed in linen is who he had this vision of at the beginning of chapter 10. So the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven. So this is why we're saying that heaven is God's dwelling place, as we've seen in many other passages of Scripture. Holding up, when someone make an oath, you know, they put up one hand. This is an absolute oath, right hand and left hand up to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished." So one is asking this man in linen, when is, when is this going to be fulfilled? When are these wonders going to happen? When are these things going to wrap up? And this man, if this is Jesus, is raising his hand up to the Father. Now, do we see Jesus praying in the Gospels? Absolutely. And he's raising his hand, swore by him who lives forever, which is God, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half time. Now, we know that in apocalyptic literature and in visions, numbers are very symbolic often. This may be referring to the three and a half years of the end of the tribulation, or it may just be saying it's going to be wrapped up in a particular time. There is a time, and God's going to end it. 
And it says it's going to happen when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, which makes me believe that this is talking about the tribulation, for there's going to be a, the Antichrist going against God's people, and whenever that has reached its fulfillment, and then God, Jesus, will return, and all these things shall be fulfilled. So what happens when we die? Well, followers of God find rest. So the same man in linen is speaking to Daniel in chapter 12, 11 through 13. And he tells them, And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. More numbers. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, argument about what these numbers mean. But here this is describing when the daily sacrifices are taken away. So when the Antichrist comes and stops the sacrifices, it's going to be in the new temple. And he sets up the abomination of desolation. And if you remember, as we talked about Antiochus, he sacrificed a pig to Zeus in the temple and it was desecrated. So this is at the very end though. And there should be 1,290 days. So this is three and a half years plus 30 days. What's the 30 days? Anybody got any idea? So three and a half years is the end of the tribulation. So from the time that the Antichrist betrays the people and he sets up the abomination of desolation, ends the daily sacrifices, three and a half years, but now there's 30 days. Any ideas? Well, there's a lot of different opinions about it. <laughs> It may be that in these 30 days, this is as Jesus returns, he is judging, and there's a transition into the millennial kingdom. But then as we go to verse 12, we got some more days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. So 45 more days. Again, there's a lots of opinions about what this means, but it may be that Christ is judging at the beginning, this 30 days and the 45 days, the kingdom is being set up. The nations that were ruling are coming under rule of Christ. We don't know for sure. But ultimately it says, blessed are those who wait for this to come. When the millennial kingdom is set, when Jesus comes back to earth and he's ruling on earth. But here's this promise. This is the very last verse of Daniel. Verse 13. But you, you Daniel... Go your way till the end. Continue to serve God until the day of your death, for you shall rest. And that is just a beautiful picture of what death is for believers. It's rest. That body is resting. Our souls are very much alive with Christ. But Daniel's body is going to rest. And will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days what a promise. A promise of the resurrection. Now, how do we know the resurrection is real? Jesus Christ. For you see, He is the first fruits of the resurrection. As He rose from the grave, He is never to die again. And just as He rose from the grave, we too will receive new bodies one day. So those who are in Christ today, when they die, their souls are immediately with God. But one day when Jesus returns, he will call our bodies from the grave. Our souls will be, re, will be united with these new bodies and will live in the millennial kingdom time and then in the new heaven and new earth in bodies that will never die, never get sick again. So this promise all the way back here in Daniel. Now, does anybody remember the first reference to the resurrection that we came upon in this study? So we've been going from the oldest book Forward, so we're in Daniel now. What's the first reference to the resurrection? It's in the oldest book. Job. In Job. Job's flesh is going to dec decay, but he's going to see God face to face. So the resurrection has been an expectation from long, long ago. And Jesus has shown us what this resurrection will look like. Jesus has shown us that the resurrection is true. Jesus has shown us that there is a promise for those who trust him. And just as this promise has been spoken to Daniel. And as I said, this is the man in the linen speaking to Daniel. So if that is the case, it's Jesus telling them, rest. 
You're going to arise in your heritage at the end of days. And why is that? Because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished. For Old Testament saints had faith in God, that God would do something about their sin. They didn't understand fully what God would do, but He accomplished it in His Son. Moving on to the next part, what will we be like in heaven? I don't think we've even had any answers in this, maybe in Daniel, but I've got two here in the last chapter. One, we will be radiant or glorified or beautiful. This is Daniel 12 and 3. It says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So who is wise? Those who trust God. Who is the fool? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. But the wise, they will shine like the brightness of the firmament. And what does it mean, those who turn many to righteousness? Witness. Witness. What is our call as a church? It is to point people to Jesus Christ. So there's a promise of us being glorified. So what is it to be glorified? It's when we receive our, our new bodies one day. And we get a little bit of picture of this that his glory is a glory that God is giving to us. For when Moses was on the mountain, do you remember when he came down from the mountain after he had been talking to God, his face was glowing. So they had to put a veil over his face until that glow would die down. I can kind of imagine this would be a bit like the glowing we will have. And Jesus, as he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, as Peter and James and John saw him, again, he has a glow about him. It's beautiful. It's radiant. And all believers will be beautiful and radiant, glorious. And also we will be holy. This is something we've talked about over and over again through this study. Holiness. Daniel 12 and 10. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. The wise shall understand the promises of God. The wise shall understand the warnings of God as well. And we will be purified. That is, we will be made holy. We will be made white. Again, a picture of our sins being washed away. We'll be refined. We'll be made new. And we really can see the three aspects of holiness in this passage. For we are justified in Christ. That is, we are declared holy first. In the court of law, no longer are our sins against us when we turn to Christ. For He takes our sin and gives us His holiness. We are justified, declared not guilty. Then we are sanctified throughout life. We are set apart for holiness, so we're being refined, aren't we? We're being made more and more like Jesus. And what is the end? We will be glorified. We will shine like the brightness of the firmament. We will have new bodies Bodies like Christ that will never die again. And moving on to what is heaven like? Now this is a very, very interesting passage. So we've talked about that in the book of Job, again going back to the oldest book, that it shows that Satan has some kind of access to the heavenly courtroom. And now what that all means we don't fully grasp, but... God is on his throne and the, the angels are coming before him. Satan comes before him. And God says, Satan, where have you been? And he says, I've been wandering to and fro on the earth. So Satan's not ruling hell. As I've said before, forget about Looney Tunes cartoons. Satan's not ruling hell. He's wandering the earth right now. But he has access before God's throne, accusing the saints daily. Now, who, who is arguing for us daily? Jesus, exactly. But here we've got this picture of spiritual warfare. Now just like Job had no idea about the spiritual warfare that was going on behind the scenes of the book of Job. You know, Satan was saying, I'm, I'm going to hurt Job. And God says, have you seen Job? Have you seen what he, who he is? That he's a, a righteous man? That he, he follows me no matter what? And Satan's like, no, nah, he only follows you because you bless him. And then he only follows you because you give him health. But Job continued to follow God, continued to trust God. But here we have another picture of spiritual warfare. Now, spiritual warfare is discussed maybe a lot more in some other denominations other than Baptists. Sometimes 
I think even just being in the United States, we are a little bit immune to the, the spiritual aspect, that there is spiritual warfare. But you go to some of our brothers and sisters in Africa and areas like that, they very much are aware of demonic influences and things that are going on. I, I remember one account of this missionary group that was, I think it was in Africa, and they were going in and they were witnessing to the people about Jesus. And they were like, oh yeah, we know who he is. Like, well, how do you know who Jesus is? Well, the demons tell us about him. Whoa. <laughs> but that kind of stuff is going on. And now we have right here a count of spiritual warfare. So I've, I've written it out as angels and demons are battling in the heavenly realm. It may really be better to describe this as a spiritual realm. That's where we're not seeing what's going on. But what's happening here is Daniel has been praying. So after this vision he had, maybe he had a vision of this warfare going on or maybe what was to come, and he had the vision of the man at the river and the linen that was glowing, and now he falls down as he's dead and someone touches him and awakens him. And we find out that Daniel had prayed and God sent an angel to, to basically come to Daniel because of his prayer but the angel had been delayed because he was fighting a demon, a fallen angel. Have you ever thought about that? That your prayers, <laughs> there's spiritual warfare going on because of your prayers? I remember someone warning me, particularly when I was called to ministry, that spiritual warfare was going to increase. And boy, were they correct. It's just, it's insane the things that have happened in the past four years. Yeah, you know what? Demons, Satan, are not, is not happy about doing God's work. Not at all. So let us continue to be faithful to stay close to God, to pray, to remember Him, to go to His Word, because Satan is always trying to cause trouble. He's always going to try to, to tempt us, to trick us. But here we are in Daniel 10, 10 through 21. So Daniel, after he's fallen down like he is, he was dead, suddenly a hand touched me. So again, if that vision was Jesus, this is not Jesus touching him here. But if it's the same being that he saw that's touching him, it's an angel. And it may be Gabriel. So you remember Gabriel had given him an interpretation of the vision already. And we talked about Gabriel just recently being Christmas time. Where did, who did Gabriel come to? Mary. Mary and Zechariah. Yeah. And probably Joseph as well. That's mm -hmm. right. So it says, Suddenly a hand touched me, which may be Gabriel, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved. This tells us a lot about Daniel, doesn't it? Man greatly beloved. He was a faithful follower of God. It says, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. So certainly an angel coming with the, uh, with the message. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Remember how Jesus tells us that we need to be persistent in our prayers? Maybe some of these things are happening. There's a spiritual warfare going on and we need to continue to be persistent in our prayers. But look at Daniel. He, he has set his heart to understand God. Set his heart to understand what God revealed to him. He humbled himself before God and his words were heard by God. And this angel has been sent because of his words. Verse 13 but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to me, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, the kings of Persia. These are demons he's talking about. So there's a demonic influence upon these pagan nations. And I was thinking about it as I was studying this, is there a demonic influence upon the United States of America? I'd certainly say yes. I would certainly say yes. 
And here's a spiritual warfare going on. As God's people are faithfully praying, certainly there's angels fighting against this demonic influence. But this angel, who again, is probably Gabriel. He's fighting against this demonic influence by himself for 21 days. This is what's delayed him in coming to Daniel. But behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So here's another, the next angel that's named in the Bible, Michael. Now, Michael is called a chief prince or an archangel. So he's like, there's different levels of angels. And Michael is considered the prince of, of Israel, that he is watching over Israel, intervening for Israel. But this one angel cannot uh, really win this battle by himself, so Michael comes along and helps him. Verse 14, Now I have come, since the battle has been won at this point, now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. So in the future. And this is not just the end time future, but what's to happen from Daniel's day up to the end times. It says, For the vision refers to many days yet to come. And then in verse 20, Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. So even though he'd been fighting for a while, the battle had been won for a moment, now he's going back to fight this prince of Persia again, wherever this may be. Maybe a heavenly realm, spiritual realm, somewhere that we're visually we do not see. It says, And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. So again, he's going to have to fight demonic influence of the kingdom of Greece. Verse 21, But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. So Michael, your prince, the archangel, is going to come and help him fight these princes or demons of Greece as well. And what this scripture of truth that the angel is giving Daniel, we read throughout chapter 11. And you can take some time to read through this chapter on your own. It's amazing the fulfillment of history that we look at. As we see the Medo-Persian Empire and then Alexander the Great coming along. And then Alexander the Great dying. And then the Seleucids and Ptolemy kingdoms, which were two of the breakoffs from Alexander the Great. And they're fighting back and forth, back and forth. And eventually from the Seleucids, we have Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, who we mentioned last week is our precursor to the Antichrist. So 536 BC is when Daniel's having this vision, okay? Alexander the Great came in 331 BC. The, uh, and then Antiochus IV came in 168-167 B.C. to def, um, defile the temple. And then it was 164 B.C. that the Maccabean revolt went and reclaimed the temple and dedicated it back to God, and that's where Hanukkah comes from. So Daniel's chapter 11 is talking about a huge chunk of history. So guess what? Liberal scholars say there's no way that Daniel wrote this. It must have been written by some anonymous writer a long time later because all this stuff, you know, happened. Now, why, did, why would someone conclude that? Because basically they don't believe that God can predict the future. But guess what? God can predict the future. God has revealed it to Daniel. And it's very interesting if you get into the ancient text too because it goes back and forth between uh, some different languages. And if it really had been this much later time, it would have probably been written just flat out in Greek because Greek was the dominant language after this period. But it's not. It's in Hebrew, I believe, in this particular part of the text too. So this uh, just telling amazing things about what is to come. But it doesn't just end with Antiochus. It also goes to the point of talking about the Antichrist, the one that has not come yet, the one that Jesus has talked about as well. So how can we know anything about heaven? How can we know anything about the future? How can we know anything about God? Well, it's through special revelation, as we've talked about throughout this study. Daniel 10, 1 through 3. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And why do you think it pointed this out? Now, you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Those are their Babylonian names. They, their names were changed when they were captured and brought to Babylon. 
Daniel's name was also changed to Belteshazzar, but we read his name Daniel most of the time through the book. Why do you think, this is when Cyrus, the king of Persia, is in control now. Why does it say Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar? You don't think. Where's he at? He's still in what was the Babylonian territory. And this is a couple years after Jews were allowed to go back to Jerusalem. So this is really kind of saying, this is Daniel who's still in a foreign land. Daniel who has not gone back to Jerusalem. And he says he had a vision and a message was revealed to him and the message was true. But the appointed time was long, so he has this vision of the future. And he understood the message. So he understood whatever this is. This may not even be the message we have detailed in chapter 11, but Daniel understood this vision he had and had understanding of the vision. And in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Whatever it was that God had revealed to him hit Daniel hard, didn't it? He was mourning three full weeks. Now you think about it, this is a time of celebration in a way because the Jews had gone back to Jerusalem. They're going to be building the temple, uh, building the walls eventually back as well. But Daniel is mourning over this vision he sees. And maybe it is this uh, heavenly battle uh, that he saw. But he, he knows there's, there's still some troubles to come. The Antichrist to come. Antiochus even to come. And verse 3, this is how he, he mourned. He, I, I ate no pleasant food. No meat or wine came into my mouth nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So he was grieving. Have you ever been like that in prayer? Have you ever just been overwhelmed with what God's revealing to you and you just, you just can't pick yourself up? You're like, Lord, how am I supposed to, to, to maybe to accept this? Or how can I deal with the fact that this is what we're going to have to go through? He was grieving. And you know, really, I would say Daniel was fasting. And yet again, that's something that maybe we don't practice enough uh, or don't have enough awareness of as Baptists. Is fasting is definitely appropriate. If physically you're able to fast, I would encourage you to take some time to fast. Maybe it's just a meal. But in that place at that time you would be spending eating that meal, pray to God. And every time you have hunger pains in between the next meal, it's a reminder. Pray to God. Set aside the things you normally do, and focus on the Lord. And Daniel did. Going on with this vision, so some of these other beliefs that we see, Antiochus IV Epiphanes would be a type of Antichrist. Anybody remember what Epiphanes meant? God manifest. So he thought he was Zeus in human form. So Antiochus. And he is the little horn that's described as coming from Greece in the book of Daniel. This is Daniel eleven twenty nine 29 through 35. At the appointed time, he shall return and go toward the south. So 11's got all kind of history, and this is getting to verse 29. At the appointed time, he shall return and go toward the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return enraged against the Holy Covenant and do damage. So Antiochus is going to invade Egypt. He's tried to invade Egypt before. Didn't really have much success. But now ships from Cyprus come against him. Does anybody know what nation this would be? Who came up after Greece? Rome. So Rome is already showing up in this history here. By this time, Rome came and stopped Antiochus from going into Egypt. And as he comes back, if you remember what we talked about last time, they had heard in Jerusalem that Antiochus had died in battle, which wasn't true. So there was a revolt of the high priest that had been removed, Jason. So he's trying to take over Jerusalem. Antiochus comes back and he returns in rage and he does damage. He kills many, many men, rapes many, many women, takes many people to, to slavery in Jerusalem. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. What do you think it means he shall show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant? Now, were all the Jews following God? 
Many of them were Hellenized by this point that they were really accepting the Greek culture. So he really just aligns with these that are accepting the Greek culture, not the ones that are truly following God. In verse 31, If forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress, and they shall take away the daily sacrifices. And there's that prediction that had come up before. The daily sacrifices will end. So the temple, they're not able to sacrifice anymore. And place there the abomination of desolation. So he does go in and sacrifice a pig to Zeus, which you know, a pig is an unclean animal to the Jewish people. He forces some of the people to eat of the pig. He puts uh, pig broth all over everything in the temple that he can. He makes people stop circumcision, stop all the sacrifices in the temple. And this abomination of desolation is probably this uh, basically idol to Zeus that is a meteorite. <laughs> a meteorite fell from, from the sky and they said, oh, something to honor Zeus. So he put this in the temple. So he's completely defiling the temple. And if you remember, there is still an Antichrist to come because Jesus said that this will happen in the end, that the abomination of desolation will be set up. Well, Antiochus was long before Jesus came. So there's still an Antichrist to come. But again, he kind of is a precursor to this Antichrist, the last figure. In verse 32, those who do wickedly against the covenant... He shall corrupt with flattery. So again, those of the Jews are not really following God. They're going to be corrupted with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. So here's the Maccabeans that we talked about. The Jewish people that are kind of doing guerrilla warfare and eventually they get to Jerusalem. Verse 33, And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. So it's a tough time. But they're fighting for the honor of God. They're fighting for the temple. Verse 34. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but, may shall jo- but many shall join, them, uh, join with them by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white. Now, what did we say that was describing earlier? Refining, purifying, making them white. Somebody in heaven, right? So guess what happens to some of these faithful? They die. They die fighting. They're martyrs <coughs> fighting to, to reclaim the temple. And it says, until the end, uh, time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Now, this is kind of like the, the marker where things change in chapter 11. Until the end of the uh, time of the end, until the appointed time. This stuff happened already now in our time. Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, uh, Antiochus fourth Epiphanes came. The Maccabeans revolted. They reclaimed the temple. But now there's another to come. This is still in the future. A final antichrist will rise and be defeated in the last days. This is Daniel eleven. 36 through 45. And this is describing the little horn of Rome that we read about in Daniel. It says, Then the king shall do according to his own will. So this is the Antichrist. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. This is coming. The Antichrist. He's going to seek people to worship him. He's exalting himself above all other gods and of blaspheming against the one true God. And he's going to have wrathful vengeance upon God's people in the tribulation period. Verse 37, He shall regard neither the gods of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall exalt himself above them all. So a couple things I wanted to point out in verse 37. If you have a King James or New King James, it probably translates God of his fathers, but it is appropriate to translate as plural too, which is probably more appropriate because it appears the Antichrist is not going to be from the Jewish people. He's going to probably be from Rome, heritage, European in some way. But he shall regard neither the gods of his fathers, so whatever heritage he has, he's not going to regard those gods. He's not worshiping those gods. He's exalted himself. And there's an interesting phrase, nor the desire of women. It says homosexual. So that's where that comes from. So some people think that the Antichrist may be a homosexual in the last days. Which, you know, in our 
current climate, I find that an interesting possibility because if you think about right now, if you speak out against homosexual homosexuality, you're really like, you know, you're a bad person, right? So you could see if a leader was rising up and he was homosexual and anybody was saying anything against him, people might be like, how dare you say anything against this man? But that actually might not be what this verse means. And I've said that before about the fact that he may be a homosexual. But as I dig down into this text, it may be referring to the gods these, the women particularly worshipped. Not the fact that he has no not, no desire of women, but he doesn't care about the gods that the women are worshiping like Aphrodite as well. So that's a possibility of that. But we don't know for sure. But either way, he's definitely exalting himself above all others. Verse 38. But in their place he shall honor a god of fortresses. What is a god of fortresses? He loves war. That's what he loves. Have we had rulers throughout times that have loved war? Are there rulers now that love war? Oh, yeah. And the Antichrist is going to love war, too. So he shall honor a god of fortresses, war itself. And a god which the fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. And moving to 44. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. So the Antichrist has a period of peace as he rules. But then the great tribulation and the three and a half years of the end, it gets worse and worse. The whole world is suffering. So guess what? Some of the nations are probably upset with the Antichrist at this point, the fact that he can't relieve their suffering. So they're coming to battle against him. So this troubles him. And we read about this in Revelation as well. It says, Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many this is the battle of Armageddon. How does the battle of Armageddon end? Jesus wins. Jesus wins, that's right. Verse 45, And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. So Jerusalem and the seas. And he, and he shall come to his end and no one will help him. As we read in Revelation, when Jesus returns, the Antichrist is thrown alive into the lake of of fire the lake of fire so he loses Jesus wins and it says that these other armies that are coming that are fighting he destroys with the word of his mouth you know the armies of heaven coming with Jesus Jesus doesn't really need that backup does he but with the word of his mouth he destroys his enemies and the antichrist is thrown into the lake of fire so a lot in Daniel. But look at this last part. This is, shows about the resurrection. And it tells us that all people will be resurrected. Don't miss that. All people, not just those that know God, all people will be resurrected. Daniel 12 and 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So those that know Christ, when he returns, he calls us from the grave. Our body is, sleep, is sleeping in the dust. Our souls are alive. Our souls are conscious in heaven now. He calls our bodies to wake up and we wake to everlasting life. See, we're always meant to be body and soul. And we will be body and soul forever. But some, those who have rejected Christ, will awake to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, there's some disagreement about when this resurrection will take place. Some believe that it will take place when Jesus returns at the same time of all the other resurrections. I believe it actually will take place at the end of the millennial kingdom. So it's the great white throne judgment that we read in Revelation. So Jesus, when he returns, all those who are in Christ will be resurrected. And then at the end of the millennial kingdom, all those that are lost will be resurrected. They will be judged. And they will be judged for, for what they have done. There is degrees of punishment even in hell. And they will awake, it says, to shame and everlasting contempt. They're thrown into the lake of fire alive. And they have shame and everlasting contempt. You know, Jesus describes hell as uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if you think about the weeping kind of sees the shame or maybe you're upset, 
But that gnashing of teeth shows us that these people are angry with God forever. Forever. What a miserable eternity. Angry with God forever, and there's nothing they can do about it. They rejected the opportunity to turn to Christ. You know what? Salvation is as free as the air you breathe. If you're willing to humble yourself, repent, and turn to Christ, you can have everlasting life. And this great promise that we read in Daniel will be resurrected. Resurrected to eternal life. So what a great ending to the book of Daniel. And as we see through chapter 10 and 12, God's work in Daniel, angels and demons are battling in the heavenly realm. There is realm, there is spiritual warfare going on. We see that a final antichrist will rise and be defeated. Don't forget that part. He will be defeated. Followers of God will find rest at death, and they will be radiant and holy. And truly, that's probably more in the resurrection period that will be radiant and holy in our new bodies. And all people will be resurrected. The bodies of God's people will awake to an everlasting life. That will be everlasting life in the millennial kingdom and the new heaven and earth. And the bodies of God's enemies will awake to everlasting contempt. And that will be in the lake of fire. So again, Daniel really ends with a bang. Telling us about the future to come. And next we'll be going into the book of Haggai. And we'll start looking at the Jews that are returning to Jerusalem as they work to rebuild the temple. But anybody have anything to add to this tonight or questions? A lot of good stuff. I thought particular that about the angels battling with the demons was very, very interesting. Thinking about our prayers, maybe causing spiritual warfare in the, in the realm that we can't see. But you know what? God is on our side. And if God is for us, who can be against us? You know, I've heard one time, like, Richard Nixon helped to use that term for yeah. the United States, and he likened himself to Cyrus. <laughs> Sending the Jews back home. Well, you yeah. know, because he didn't really like the Jews, but his mama told him as a small boy that if he ever had a chance to help the Jews, he should. Mm -hmm. You know, and some people thought that he was the Antichrist, too. <laughs> but Nixon? Yeah. But they said when he helped them, I mean, he really helped them, you know, mm -hmm. in that war. The yeah. United States came to the aid. You know, he said that about Cyrus. I don't think I've mentioned this in here, but so Cyrus gave that, that command that the people could go back. They've actually found a scroll. It's a like a clay, I guess. It's a Cyrus scroll that has that declaration for the people to be able to return back. Yeah, so we have the historical background connections to, to the Scripture. It's really neat. Really neat. Any other questions or... Thoughts? All right. Everybody's mind's blown, so let's... <laughs> no. And, and do take some time to read through chapter 11, especially if you have a commentary Bible. And it's, it just gives you all these different details of things that have happened in, in the history up until Antiochus and then the Antichrist, the end of chapter 11. Well, let's close with a word of prayer tonight. Father, I thank you for the privilege of knowing you and having your word. And I thank you for the privilege of eternal life that is through Jesus Christ. I thank you that we know no matter what battles we face here that you win, which means we win as well, Lord. And help us to be very aware that there is spiritual warfare. There is a demonic influence upon the world as the devil is called the God of this world. Help us not to be conform to this world, but help us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, and that we would be persistent in prayer, that we'd be in your word, adjusting our lives to your word, and that we would be faithful always to tell others the good news, the freedom that we can have in Jesus Christ. Father, bless us as we learn more about you from your word, and help us to be more like you right now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.